Okay, after some delay, we are on the air. Uh, so you can let David know that we're, we're up and running. Okay. All right, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, and yes, uh, there is nothing wrong with celebrating the Gregorian New Year. Uh, January 1st is perfectly fine, and it's always nice to say, yay, we've lived another day, and turn that little dial on the, uh, the, the calendar. So, uh, but of course, some things are eternal and don't change with New Year's, and one of those is Mishnah. Uh, which means we keep studying Mishnah like we've been studying Mishnah uh, all along. And that means we are going to pick up where we left off from last week or last year uh, on Chapter 3, Mishnah 7. Bring this a little closer for my old eyes. All right, so we are on Chapter 3, Mishnah 7. We're still an idiot, and we are still going to be bouncing from topic to topic. Uh, and this one will seem a little familiar, and, well, we'll do it when we get to it. <laughs> I don't like to give too many previews, but I don't have to. Are uh, you still willing to... Uh, uh, yes, this is idiot 3-7. 3-7. Four cases. Four cases. Four cases of doubt. Rabbi Joshua pronounces impure, and the sages pronounce them pure. <laughs> All right, so again, we are talking about ritual purity issues here. And in this case, there are four cases where there is what we call suffix. There is doubt. Uh, it's uncertainty about what exactly happened. And in those cases, sometimes we have to rule as a, we have to make a rule generally that something is pure, or we make a rule generally that something is impure. Uh, you might be thinking that, hey, if there's doubt, we should just say no, right? That it's always impure. But the problem is, for not just that, but for anything in Jewish life, is that as soon as you make a rule that you always take the, in quote, stringent rule, you are being lenient on something else. So let's say, for example, that a person needs to bring a sacrifice in the ancient sacrificial service, and you are ruling always, it must be impure if there's any doubt, you have now been strict on whether or not he gets to go to the temple, but you're being lenient on his ability to be able to provide the sacrifice. Now he can't bring a sacrifice, so you must be saying that he doesn't have to. Right? So you have to balance different mids vote. Uh, same thing with regards to, uh, for example, family purity. A lot of people say, oh, we should just be always strict. If there's any hint that you know there is a reason for husband and wife to be separate um, during this time, then you should always be strict. Count the seven clean days. Go to the mikvah, blah, 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 blah. That's great. But do you want the family to have children? Right? Because if you're always ruling strict, then they won't be doing the activity necessary to make children. And if they don't do that activity, they're not going to have any kids. It's just the way biology works. Uh, not to mention the fact that it could put a stress on the relationship between husband and wife. Mm -hmm. So just making blanket rulings of always off, off the table, or always impure, it's not really healthy, it's not advisable, and it's not what the Mishnah wants us to do. So instead, we get to argue and debate about all the details. Um, that doesn't mean that we're always going to be right, but it does mean we will always be doing it the right way. And that is what Judaism asks us to do. Right? And if that, that should be on the bumper sticker, right? And <laughs> we won't always be right, but we'll always do it the right way. Because we have no answer key, remember? Right? We can't look in the back of the book. It's not like in the back of the Torah and all of the appendixes. It actually gives you the answer to every issue in life. Instead, gives you the process to find the answer for every issue in life. Follow the process. You can at least feel confident that you've done what you should to get the answer. And we won't actually find out if we were 100% absolutely correct until we get to Olam Haba, the next world. Four cases of doubt. <laughs> Four cases of doubt that Rabbi Joshua pronounces impure and the sages pronounce impure. How is this so? Right, so what, is, what are these four cases? If the impure person stands and the pure person passes by him, or if the pure person stands and the impure person passes by him. Right, ships in the night, two people standing and it is unclear, it is doubtful whether or not they actually came into contact, right? But one of them is moving, one of them isn't moving, and we're not sure who might have come into contact or not. Because remember, if there is a position of moving in a public domain, then we will usually rule leniently. If there's a position of a sta stationary, then usually we rule strictly. But in this case, if there's movement and only possible contact, then how do we decide in these cases? Is this a reference to a crowded public place? Not especially. Because wouldn't you know if it wasn't crowded, if it's just two people? 
Really? You know like every piece of your clothing that comes into contact with someone else's piece of clothing? I think I do. <laughs> if it's just me and someone you, else. You don't wear togas, do you? <laughs> right? So if you're wearing anything like a cloak or anything like a loose, um, robish type wow. thing, which was the standard all the way up until the Middle Ages or later, depending upon where you lived, you wouldn't know where the hem uh, of your clothing was always bumping into people. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many times I've been in just the sanctuary uh, or, or really actually recently not such an issue, but in the earlier days when I would be in a pew rather than on the bima, I go to put my talit on or I go to flick my talit back up on the shoulder and I hit eyes everywhere with the tzitzit, flicking this way and that way. <laughs> and half the time, I don't think I even know it until I hear the person go, ah. So <laughs> clothing can actually be a little bit more um, expansive than we're used to. Um, what we wear nowadays is, is much more form-fitting than we ever wore before. Oh, if impurity is in the private domain and something pure is in the public domain, or if something pure is in the private domain and something impure is in the public domain. Right, so again, private and public also create a different tension of which way we assume, but here we've actually created a mix. So we've got someone who's standing at the door to his house and there's someone walking past, right? The house is a private domain, the street is a public domain, and the way we would rule is different if we were both on the street or both in the house. Mm. But we're on that threshold, how do we rule? The sages, the sages say that it is, um, in, uh, sorry, the, the sages say that it is pure, but Rabbi Joshua says it is impure. Uh, by the way, again, sages win. Yeah, good. If it is doubtful in all of these cases whether one touched or did not touch the other, or if it's doubtful whether one formed a tent over the other or did not form a tent over the other. Remember, that that's not just actually forming a tent, like throwing up your um, Boy Scout canvas over the person, but also using your own body to create a, a covering over another person. Or if it is doubtful whether one moved or did not move, the other... Oh, did not move the other. Rabbi Joshua pronounces such a case impure, and the sages pronounce it pure. Right. So again, the, the sages are simply saying, with all of these doubts, we are going to say there's too much doubt. And therefore, the, the default position for every person is that they do not transmit. Uh, there's no pure impurity transmitted. Whereas Rabbi Joshua says, because there's doubt, we could think that there's something that's happened that's incorrect. And therefore, we will say that impurity is transmitted. Um, make sense? Hmm. Okay. Again, so he's being very, very strict. Yes. And they're making it a little bit easier. Well, the, the, they are they are simply saying that without any evidence to the contrary, right. and Absolutely. given that we've already got doubt of where the situation is and therefore which rule should we should be following, we'll simply stick at the default position. And the default position is people are ritually pure until proven otherwise. Um, remembering, of course, that being ritually impure is not a crime. Um, and that sounded a bit too much like, you know, guilty until proven innocent, but it is a status that can make life a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, and therefore, it's simply the default status that we are in. What happened to, was there a general rule to go with the majority? Uh, there's a general rule of going with the majority for, for many topics, um, but then there are subcategories of which majority are we counting from? Right. So in this particular case, there's no majority to, to, to work with because you can't say the majority of people who are moving past people who aren't moving when one of them is pure and one of them is impure in a public domain, the majority of the time X happens right? without doing a exhaustive um, population study. We can't come up with the majority of what the result is of that kind of situation. Um, the classic example of going after a majority is the, uh, the, the case of uh, meat found in the public domain. Uh, and, and yes, this is not what we do with modern meat care uh, or, or health and hygiene, but if you are walking down the street and you find a piece of meat, um, how do you know if it's kosher or not? Because right? remember, it's once, kosher once it's, place. what's that? Isn't it meat that's supposed to kosher place? If the majority of the people in that area keep kosher, the meat is presumed kosher, you mm -hmm. take it home, you throw it on the barbecue. Uh, well, make sure that it's kosher in terms of the blood being removed, because back in the day, most people had to remove the blood themselves. It wasn't done by the butcher like it is now. Um, but yeah, most of us would say, whoa, you're eating street uh, street meat. Um, but even regarding <laughs> regardless of that, it's how do you know it's kosher? You don't know that it's kosher, right? Because there's no way to do a DNA test to make sure that it's kosher. 
not, not back then and, and not back now. I'm talking about like beef rather than things that are obviously pork. Um, and so you would simply go after the majority. Well, all my neighbors are Jewish and they keep kosher, so this must be one of their pieces of meat. And since it is ownerless because it has been abandoned in the middle of the street and someday will cover the laws of law lost and found, therefore it's free for me to take and I can go eat it. Yum, yum. So, so all doubt means is burden of proof really then. I'm not, I'm not as fluent in American legal terms, so in terms of... For absent any proof to the contrary, which would be probably a lot of times 51% standard, it would be deemed... Right, but not. it's not... The, the burden of proof is, yes, sometimes used as a, uh, a litmus test of who has to make... Who, who's making the claim has to actually provide the evidence. Um, but in terms of issues of other forms of doubt, Sometimes it's not a question of proof, it's just a question of what rule has the Torah given us for interpretation from the sages? What have they given us as how to handle that situation? Here, the reason why, sorry, here, as I already put down the page, the reason why this is an issue and an argument between the sages is because you have a doubt about situations that are also doubtful, right? And that has shaded the edges to the point where it's really unclear what's going on. And there you have a question of how should we handle a, a doubly unclear situation. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, it's then the rabbis come up with their rule of thumb. Um, not necessarily because it's a burden of proof, but it just seemed to be the to them to be the most um, correct interpretation of how to handle the situation. And since they all voted for it, that's what we've got. Majority. That's where the case where majority rules. <laughs> if all the sages or the majority of the sages agree that this is the correct interpretation. Lo and behold, it is the correct interpretation. But you never find Rabbi Yeshua is consistent with the laws of uh, Shabbat. Because for Shabbat, if you go from one from the one domain to the other, you have problems. So that's why Rabbi Yeshua has probably he thinks the same logic. If you touch something from one domain to the other, should be impure. So uh, he's consistent. Is the the other the other side that are Going not not it. exactly. I mean, really, what, what the issue is, and I don't know if a drawing will help, but I'll try, right? That's the street. And that's the house. Right? And then we got our two guys right here on the edge of the two. There is one law for the street, and there is one law for the house. Right? And the issue is not... Um, is somebody doing something wrong, like in Shabbat, where there's a question of um, passing things through one domain to the next. The question is, which law applies here? Right? Because one guy is in the street, so do I follow his law? Or the other guy in the house, do I follow his law? Right? Because like I said, if there were two people in the house, we would follow the house law. And if there were two people in the street, we would follow the street law. And then we could sort out the, 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 the doubt, handling it with the law of each domain. But because we have one in one domain, one in the other domain, who whose law wins? Yeah, it's well, like, um, imagine if someone, uh, it's, like the old, it's like the old joke, right? The, um, a plane crashes on the uh, Canada-America uh, Canada border. Where do you bury the survivors? <laughs> don't bury them. You don't bury survivors. but. <laughs> but the, the real question would be, if a, if a plane crashed on the border, half in America, half in Canada, who's responsible for the crash investigation? Which country? Right? So that's what's happening here. You, you have half the issue on one, in one jurisprudence in, in jurisdiction, and you have half the issue in the other jurisdiction. Whose law wins? And, and Rabbi Yoshua says, because it's about just Render the thing impure. And the sages say, no, because it's doubt, render it pure. So it's a little different than the Shabbat situation, um, because this is not about a, a very clear Shabbat law, which is one domain to the next is prohibited. This is about, I have a law for this area, and I have a law for that area. I just don't know ha what happens when they meet. And that's what the sages are trying to answer for us. There just happened to be one guy who didn't agree. <laughs> All right, so now we are on idiot 3-8. Three, three, three things Rabbi Zadok pronounces liable to receive impurity, 
and the sages pronounce them not liable to receive impurity. Okay, so uh, reminder, we've covered this topic before, but let me repeat just briefly, hopefully, um, which is to say, if I have a branch off a tree, the branch cannot become ritually impure, right? Because it is just a piece of wood. However, if I take that branch and I carve it into a spoon, the spoon can now become ritually impure. Right? There is a moment somewhere in the manufacture of an item where it goes from being a natural object to being a man-made object. And when it passes that moment, bam, now it is susceptible to ritual impurity. Uh, and sort of, again, a reminder, just a little fact check, if this were not the way, then how would you know every stone, every stick, every piece of sand? Do you know whether it's ever come into contact with a dead creature or something that was ritually impure? Have you been following that stone for the last four billion years to know what it has touched? There's doubt, though. Exactly. And because of the doubt, because of the fact that that's not the case, we believe God's world in its natural state cannot become ritually impure, right? It is bulletproof when it comes to uh, purity issues. But once I've taken it, well, God tells me that my items can become ritually impure, right? He says, your pots, your pans, that your stuff can become ritually impure. So if my stuff can become ritually impure, but nature stuff can't, but my stuff's made out of nature, where does that happen? Where, where does the magic moment of transformation occur? And in general, the idea has been if it's a finished product and if it's an actual product that is not broken. That's something that we've talked about in a couple different places. That's the, the basic um, prologue to what we were about to see. Is all of these issues have to do with, is it really a thing? First is the nail of the money changer and the chest of grist makers and the nail of a stone dial. Okay. <laughs> because well, well, go ahead and read the pronouncement. Oh, Rabbi Zadok pronounces liable to receive impurity, and the sages pronounce them not liable to receive impurity. Okay. Wow. So, that's a nail, right? And I'll switch colors just to make it clear. And I'm a money changer. Now, back in the day of money changing, I don't do this by looking up what the current exchange rate is, right? I, that, that wasn't money changing back then. Money changing back then was, you give me five ounces of this metal, I'll give you 10 ounces of that metal, right? And, and the coins would be stamped and, and all of that, and that was great for how you handle currency, but the currency wasn't worth the picture on the coin, the currency was worth the metal the coin was made of, right? This was the standard for how we handled money up until about the 20th century. So the question is, sure, the scales, those are actual man-made objects with a purpose. They can clearly become ritually impure. But the nail sticking out of the wall that I hang them off of so that they can, you know, freely move and balance and all of that, is that a thing? Is that like actually a real man-made object? Or is that just like, poof, just something I stuck in the wall that doesn't, it's not really finished. It doesn't really have an identity by itself. It's, it's just a bit, right? Because think about it like for building a chair. Do you think every nail is a thing or do you think nails make the chair? And once they're all together, they make a thing, right? Well, Certainly the nails in the chair, those can become ritually impure, but the nail before it gets in the chair, maybe it can't. So the question is, is this nail part of the scales or is this nail just a thing that happens to be there and therefore, the nail itself isn't part of the identity of the object. But still, the nail is made by the human. Uh, it's, so that's potential. It is crafted by us, but it has no identity by itself. It's an ingredient to something else. It's not its own thing. It's not the bones in the body. Uh, well, <laughs> it, we before, so that's, that's, that's absolutely true when we're talking about the chair or the bookshelf or, or the table. The question here is, but but if I had a nail just scattered on the floor, they wouldn't be susceptible, right? So the question is, does this nail count as part of the whole, or does this nail just count as a thing that has no real identity by itself? And and Rabbi uh, Rabbi Zodok says it counts as part of the scale, therefore it can become ritually impure. And the sages say, nope, 
it's yeah. just it's just a thing, but not really a thing, and not part of the scales. And so it's it's like a loose ingredient that just happens to be there. Yes. So does it matter if it's on the desk or in the um, or in the wall? Because I remember we we talked about the the stove, and if it was a something that you disassemble and reassemble, it doesn't work. So it seems like if it's on the wall, you're just kind of assembling it by putting the scale on. All right, so that's the question. Is this a, a component um, that you would consider to be an essential ingredient component that it's actually needed for the scale and therefore part of it? And the, the feeling about this is that, no, it's not, right? If I were to take this scale off and move to another site, chances are I'd leave the nail where it is, right? I'm not gonna bother prying it out of the wall or whatever, and if I go to somewhere else, I could hang it on a branch. I mean, I, I don't need the nail to make it be complete, and if I take it off the nail, my scale isn't suddenly broken, right? It, it's, it's portable now, it's a feature. Um, and that's why the rabbis are basically saying it's non, um, uh, it cannot be made ritually impure because it isn't really part of the thing. It just happens to be there in the process. Now, the next one, we have a little bit of a disagreement about. So the next one, the, the chest of the grist maker, there's actually a number of different commentators that say it's not talking about the chest, but it's talking about the nail uh, again, a different nail. This time, the nail that you put the chest on um, when you have it on the wagon. So first of all, what is a grist maker? What is grist? <laughs> uh, you know, so first of all, 2019, everybody, you don't have to make your own flour. Okay, just realize how good that is. When, when, when I was little, we used to go down to uh, what they called the Museum of Man. I think they've changed the name now uh, to get rid of the word man. It was like the Anthropology Museum. And they always had somebody there with acorns because that's what the, the Native Americans used to eat in San Diego. And they had them grinding the acorns to make um, flour, acorn flour, which by the way, bleh. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, if I was starving, it was helpful knowledge. And, you have to grind it. And, and back then, the way you would do that is you would grind it with a stone against another stone. But the better way to grind when you've got huge wheat fields, not just one person going like this, the better way to grind was to put a little extra grist, a little extra gravel, a little extra hard material into the mix. And that way you weren't just grinding from top down, you were also grinding side to side. And then you sift it out when you go to uh, get your flour ready to actually eat. So you're not eating gravel. Uh, and so that grist is uh, the, what we're talking about in this case, uh, the Mishnah. Um, so grist was that hard powdered um, rock substance that you would add to your mill to help grind the flour more finely and, and to make your flour tastier. Um, nowadays, we have big industrial machines that take care of our flour for us. And thank God, because mm. <laughs> this eats up, I keep pointing, but I haven't drawn a picture. Uh, this eats up so much of uh, a person's life if they live in a pre-industrial society, mm. sitting there grinding the, the wheel to make their own, or they have to take it to the windmill where it was ground and all of that. But we digress, yes? What was this about it being a nail of a chest? Yes, that's what I'm saying. So there is an alternative opinion that says, rather than it being the chest in and of itself, but the question was that it was the nail upon which you would hang the chest oh. on the wagon um, when you would take the chest from place to place to sell your grist. Um, but even if it is the chest itself, question is still a question of, is the chest really a thing or is the chest just happen to be what you've got the grist in, right? The, the grist is what you're actually selling and even that isn't really its own thing. It's just there to help the, the, the mill work better. So does it really count as a thing? Um, personally, I agree with the commentators who argue that this is probably talking about another nail, because if they do that, then we end up with three nails in the same Mishnah, which makes it a much more poetically attractive Mishnah um, and, and why and makes you understand why these three are lumped together. But the debate goes on. The ultimate debate, of course, is more about just is it a thing or not a thing? Uh, and in this case, they also say the sages, it's not a thing. Third category. Um, if you were here last uh, um, on the first day of our Sunday school this year, um, you might have noticed that we made a rabbinic sundial. Uh, rabbinic sundials are so much easier to make than modern sundials. Modern sundials are really, really fidgety. You have to get them lined up just right, depending upon where you are on the earth and all of these other bits of information. 
Not so bad that we have GPSs in our pocket now, but it used to be much, much harder. And then you had to align them at certain times of the day. Rabbinic sundials, great. It's just a half shell <coughs> with equidistant lines. That's not equidistant. Um, but <laughs> a real one, it's just radial lines coming out uh, to divide the day into 12 segments, right? So you just end up with 12 slices of pie going around a, like imagine taking a ball and cutting it in half and then cutting the top off of it. So you just have that half or that quarter segment at the bottom and then you divide it. And right here, you put a, and we're not gonna be able to draw a perspective, you put a stick or a nail that pokes out. And when the sun hits the nail, it makes a shadow. And depending upon where the sun is, you know the time, rabbinically. Because as you might be able to guess, this perfectly divides up any day into 12 equal units for that day. That's not 60 minutes, right? Because in the summer, those 12 units are gonna be longer than 60 minutes. And in the winter, those units are gonna be shorter than 60 minutes. Um, but any idiot can make one of these, I did. So <laughs> it's really, really simple. But the question is, again, this is the thing, the sundial is the little nail that I stick in the top that sends down the shadow, is that it or not it, right? Is that part of it or not it? Or can I just throw that away and I'm not gonna be care because I can put any stick in that thing, right? And again, the answer from the sages is the nail doesn't count, right? The nail is not considered to be essential to the item enough to consider it to be part of the man-made item enough to be something that can be made ritually impure. But without the nail, you cannot know the other. Okay. And that's the answer really for all three of these from Rabbi Sodok and <laughs> anybody who would take his position, which is, but it, the scale won't work without the nail, right? If you put the scale on the table without something to hold it off of, it's just going to be, you know, laying on the table. And the chest, even we say it's the nail. If I don't have the nail, how can I hang the chest? And, and the sun died more because that, the nail is what marks the hour. No, the shadow is what marks the hour. Yeah, the shadow reflects the nail. So does that mean the sun is also essential? Can the sun become ritually impure then? No. I mean, <laughs> it, it's, it, everything is essential to get the final result that you get, because otherwise it wouldn't be the final result. But it's part of the, of the whole thing. But it is part of the object, right? So yeah. that's why, you know, none of these are, are slam dunk cases. Right? It's not like if someone said, I found a rock uh, in the river, is this man-made? And we'd all go, of course it's not man-made. And someone else says, you know, I found a, uh, a, 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 I found a computer. Uh, is, can this be made ritually impure? Of course it can be made ritually impure, obviously. These are, again, exactly the edge of, and that's why we vote. And the sages voted that this is not considered tightly bound enough to the object to be considered part of the object. Uh, and therefore, it can't be made ritually impure. So the way my computer might become ritually impure is, I don't know, if I were and I was eating a ham sandwich and dropped it on the computer, what would make a computer ritually impure? Someone, right? someone dies in the room. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll keep my ham sandwich away from it. <laughs> There was a passing raccoon who was up in the roof and he was eating a ham sandwich and yeah. he dropped it on my computer. <laughs> you laugh. Go read the first section of the Talmud of Sahin. And it is all about if you have a like a weasel or a mouse running into a house carrying a piece of bread, yeah. does it mean you have to search the whole house again? Oh. So uh, I'm not I'm not making that up yeah, about the raccoon. The What's the answer? <laughs> Teku. Teku, meaning we don't have an answer. Oh, it's oh. one of the places where it's the Talmud says, Liao, Liao, we are waiting for Liao. Exactly right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh. But it's, it's actually a really fun section, a uh, really great sugi. It's one of the ones I like to do with kids because it's like, because it goes really crazy. Because it says, so what if it was a weasel carrying the mouse yeah. in its mouth and the mouse had a piece of uh, yeah. had a piece of, of bread because it's for Pesach. And I was like, but how do you know if it runs in and it runs out? How do you know it's the same mouse? Maybe it's a different one. It's, it's just great of, of being able to look at all the options. But in the end, yes, all of these are right on the edge. So how would you make your computer? Um, uh, the classic example would be someone dies in the room. 
Mm -hmm. If someone dies in the room, the room is the ohel, the room is the tent, everything in the room becomes ritually impure. Right. Right. Another another example would be someone who is a, um, a, a zav, a, a man or a woman who has had a, a discharge uh, in a non-regular manner. Things that they touch can also become ritually impure. So the computer, if that were to happen, I mean, you'd have to, you could just take the processor out and then... Take your computer to the mikvah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not recommended. <laughs> but you, you would be able just to take a processor out and then replace it to, uh, or disassemble it and... You know, I've never heard anybody go into the details of what counts as a broken computer for the purposes of, uh, of breaking something that's become ritually impure in order that it can be re purified through its reassembly rather than immersion. Um, so I, I, I would have to look into that and I have to say that given that that particular point of ritual impurity is not important at the moment, it's not on the top of my agenda. But, it's, but it is an interesting thought experiment of how you take something um, that is so complicated in a modern sense uh, and, and render it pure again. That, that would be an interesting uh, interesting project if I had a little more time. <laughs> yeah, the question is how, how big should be the parts of the computer you can write? Is it well, big or simple? Because if you disarm only the screen... Yeah, or, just unplug it. it. <laughs> hey, it's broken, or, it doesn't yeah, work. Separate from the hard disk. Right. <laughs> how small should be? Would it go by size or essentialness? Uh, well, that would be the good question, uh, because it doesn't always work by size or by essential nature, depending on things. So, for example, you remove one leg of a, of a stove, that doesn't mean the stove is now considered to be broken. You, we actually talked about it had to be broken into smaller segments. Right. Um, remember, we talked about, like, you know, no bigger than a certain measurement of tfahim. But all those segments were equally important. It depends on how you look at it. I mean, if you... If you have half of it, you can still actually make a, a stove work, just not as well. Um, so, you know, if I take out one RAM module from my computer rather than all of them, is it broken? No, it's just slowed. Um, but th that's a whole other question for another night because that is a very long rabbit hole. <laughs> Three nine. Well, that's what happens when you ask the follow-up questions. And I'll remind you that many of the follow-up questions that you have and that you've never considered that's what the Gemara does. That's what the Talmud does, is try to work out all the permutations and long-term um, rulings that put this into further um, concrete action uh, for us. And, of course, the Talmud gives us many tangents, which we do, too. <laughs> Three, nine. So now we're switching to disagreements between Rabban and Gamaliel yes. at this age. Uh, Rabban Gamaliel. Rabban. Yes. Rabban Gamaliel pronounces susceptible to impurity, and the sages pronounce it not susceptible to impurity first. All right, so again, we're talking about is this an item or is this not an item? Uh, that's the same kind of category of discussion that we've got here. This is going to sound a little more like, well, huh? But we'll see. The cover of a metal basket, if it belongs to householders, and the hanger of a strigil? Strigil. Strigil. <laughs> Yeah, you've only got one of those at home, oh, I'm yes. sure. Yeah, I got several of them. <laughs> metal vessels which are still unshaped, and a plate that is divided into two equal parts. And the sages agree with Rabban Gamaliel in the case of a plate that was divided into two parts, one large and one small, that the large one is susceptible to impurity, and the small one is not susceptible to impurity. Okay. So. His success because his political position or because his arguments? Uh, he was, Rabban Gamaliel was the, the head of the court uh, during his generation until they fired him. Um, he was kind of impeached, um, but then he got brought back. So it's, it's a very long and, and really interesting story about Jewish politics. But what Natan is asking is, was he considered right because of his position or was he considered right because he was right? And the answer is, he was actually considered wrong for all of these, except for the very last one where they agreed about a, a similar case. They had to clarify what the disagreement was. Um, but for all the others, he was the one who had a position that the majority of the sages voted against. Therefore, he was considered wrong. Um, but it's interesting to note that in the discussion of when he was impeached um, because of his rudeness to one of his colleagues, uh, or actually Rabbi Joshua, who we heard about just recently. Um, after he was impeached, they passed many other halachot uh, when, when his absence. So whether or not he was in the minority or not was sometimes less important than the 
chilling effect he had on the decisions uh, of the great Sanhedrin, that he would often prevent things from even being discussed, or his presence would keep people from speaking their mind freely. Uh, and that was one reason why he had to be removed and why when he brought, was brought back, he was much humbler than he had been. And that allowed Judaism to continue in a much healthier fashion. But yeah, he'd become a little bit dictatorial in his time where his pride was more important than Torah. And that was a problem. Uh, it's always a problem, but when you're the leader of the Sanhedrin, it's an even bigger problem. Okay, so let's take these apart. The covering of a metal basket, if it belongs to householders. All right, so again, apparently there were a, a metal basket that you could have a cover that was kind of like a, um, well, like a grid, uh, you know, like this. And for most people, that grid was just something you put over a basket, um, just as like a, like a cover. It wasn't actually serving a real purpose. It was just like a, a loose level of protection for the basket. Apparently for doctors, that metal grid was actually used in their practice. I, I don't remember from off the top of my head all the ways the doctors used it according to the Jewish uh, interpretation, but it was an important instrument by itself. For the sages, they said, no, if this is just in like Bob's house, Bob doesn't use that, right? It's, it's just a thing. It's not really a thing. And so therefore, if it is just a regular person's metal, metal grate, then don't worry about it. It can't become impure. If it's a doctor's metal <laughs> grate, then it can become impure because it has a use. This is reintroducing to us that concept that we keep bumping up against over and over and over again, intent. Right. Oftentimes, what's important is not just what something is, but what it is thought to be, what it is used for. Um, and that is what we are hitting here. And the sages are saying the average person doesn't use it like that. Therefore, it's not really a thing. But if you did, then you'd be on the doctor's group. And that means you are going to have to worry about ritual impurity for it. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So back to like the rug example, does does your how much does your status matter? Because they said for the average person, well not the average person, they said if you had a rug, it could become impure because you could sit on it, even though most people don't. And I guess it's saying like I guess the average doctor would use that. So it's it's not it's not purely your intent. Right. It is the intent of people like you. Right? So so it's not um it's not that the halakha is individual for each person, but the, halakha, but the halakha does cluster according to standard practice. That way you don't get somebody saying, well, yes, I may be a doctor, but I'm not that kind of doctor. It's like, no, 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 no. You're in the doctor group. This is the law for you, right? If you're not in the doctor group, then that's not the law for you, unless you're in some other group that does use it. And if there's another group that uses it, then yes, it is the law for you. Right. So it, it's not just about what you do that day or not that day. It's, it's also about the group that you're in. We're going to see that uh, maybe tonight. We'll see in uh, some other cases, too. Uh, part two, the strigil. <laughs> All right. So how many of you have ever seen uh, Ben Hur? Oh, really? OK. How many of you have ever seen a funny thing happen on the way to the forum? <laughs> if you haven't seen that, that's hilarious. Um, so in Roman times, uh, people didn't have loofahs and they didn't have like sponges for going and taking a shower and a bath. Instead, they would rub a person down with oil and they would scrape it off with this hard like bone or wood stick that was almost like a knife, but it wasn't sharp. It was just like a scraper. That's what it is. That's the strigil. That's the, strigil. <laughs> All right, the strigil is the hard scraper that you use to, to wipe off the slimy grease and oil off a person uh, in order to bathe them, uh, because that was what they did. Uh, and, you know, I guess they enjoyed it. Um, I mean, I like a nice back scratcher, so maybe, <laughs> maybe that was part of the sensation that they were going for. The question in the Mishnah, however, is what about the hanger? What about the thing you hang it on? Right? Is that part of the strigil? Is that not part of the strigil? Is it a thing or is it not a thing? And again, everybody would hang it up, probably. And so Raman Gamel says, it's a thing. But the rabbis say, but you don't have to hang it up. It's not like part of it. And you probably wouldn't take the hanger with you if you were moving to a new house or something. So no, it's not a thing. So ultimately, again, the rabbis all vote. The rabbis win. Raman Gamliel 
boo-hoo, it's okay. He did not have a hard life. <sighs> Part three, the metal vessels which are still unshaped. So this is a little bit more about the question of that, that transition moment where you go from being natural to being man-made. And with most objects, it's usually pretty clear. With metal, it's a little harder to tell, right? Because metal, once you've made metal, it's already got some uses to it. And so if you've got it close to being what you want it to be, right? But it's not finished, finished, but it is really close. Like, you know, imagine you've got a, a pan and you haven't maybe attached a handle to it, or maybe you haven't shined it up or polished it, or maybe you haven't gotten all the dents out of it. Because remember, you're making this with a hammer. Is it a pan yet or not a pan? And Rabban Gamliel says, yeah, good enough. Right, close enough, it can become ritually impure. And the sages say, no, if it's supposed to be finished with other steps and it's not finished yet, it doesn't matter that you could use it. People don't use it as a regular rule and therefore not susceptible. Okay. Make sense? Okay. And then the question of the division is <clears throat> if you did have something that was made of two pieces and one of them actually was useful by itself because it was big and the other one was small then yeah, the, the, the big one can become susceptible. Um, you might think of this as something like a, um, uh, well, let's go back to our pot again, right? Someone's making a pot and they make the pot and they make the lid. The lid is like, you know, that and the pot is the size of a pot. And they've finished the pot, but they haven't finished the lid, right? Or they've still got them both in semi-usable status and they haven't finished either of them, but the pot is definitely usable. Yeah, that's kind of a pot now. Right? But if it's equal pieces, then no, neither one of them is sufficiently finished to be considered finished and therefore not susceptible. Yeah, but let's say that you, you have an alida, okay? Have a what? An alida. What's the alida in English? The hookah? Hookah. I mean, for smoking? Yes. Okay. The yep. alida. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I never use one. <laughs> okay. You should. <laughs> uh, so you have the whole part, okay? Right. But you, but you have the whole metal, right? And there's one part where you have the liquid, right? Okay, and you have the the tube, the tube, right? Okay. So you can say, oh, the tube is not part of the total, but yes, it is. Right. So any part that you take from there is the total. Right. So, yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. Yes. No, because I try to think that the way that they they thought about that one part of the being is significant that that like, like you cannot use it. It's not finished, but still it's not part. But every part is part. Also, if it's well, no, not, not, not for everything. Lead, and then I mean, it's uh, it, it's it isn't it isn't again. It comes back to standard practice. Do people often use or would be willing to use this item in its current condition, right? And with a hookah, I, I don't know whether you can use it even if you take the tube out of it, right? Or if you take the, the water chamber out of it. it. It just wouldn't be usable, right? Right. But these are talking about items that, yeah, people would use it even like that. Or in the cases of the other things, no, people wouldn't use them in that state. And so that's where we're trying to draw the line. So I'm trying to think of another. Um, the hookah. Yeah. The hookah would be, wouldn't that be similar to the oven that you could disassemble and assemble? Because you could always get another straw and put it back in. But that's not considered, assembly and disassembly is not considered breaking. Right, no, but I thought that's what he was talking about, like a hookah if the straw was missing. Well, he, he was trying to say if the hookah, if the straw was missing, couldn't you say that the straw isn't susceptible because if the straw can be detached? Right, but but the object's not usable with the straw or the tube detached. Um, I don't think it's something else that people would put up with using, but would rather was complete that would fit into this category better. Um, Nail. Well, but there's not exactly. I mean, um, uh, so so maybe a bed, right? So again, we're all in the old world here. You've got a bed. Um, beds made out of wood with, you know, slats, or in the old days they had ropes that they would tighten. Um, that was your mattress. We we'll all live in a much better world than they did. Um, but you haven't finished the carving, right? You haven't made it look pretty yet. 
Is it still a bed? Is it still usable? Would most people be willing to sleep on it and, and have it? Absolutely. No problem. But is it done? No. So that would fall into the like final category here of, of what they're saying that everybody agrees that the bed would be susceptible to ritual impurity. Um, but if you had a bed like that and you were going to attach the little balls on the like four posts to the top, and those are still on your work desk, right? Now those are going to be part of that bed. And, and the bed, everybody will use the bed, but no one's going to use the little balls that you're going to attach until they're attached, because until they're attached, they're, they're just extra bits of wood. That's the case of the smaller piece of metal, right? The little balls are, are, are not part of it yet. Once they're part of it, now they can become ritually impure, right? Once you've actually attached it, now they are part of the bed and they are ritually impure. And then you can finish all the carving. So they say you have to put the leaves in the sukkah? Well, leaves in the sukkah can't become ritually impure because they are just cut from the ground. That's one reason why the skakh, the roof of the sukkah, can't be made of man-made objects. It has to be made with only natural materials because that way the, the, the roof can never become ritually impure. Okay. Right, so that's why you don't make your skakh out of a bicycle. Or a tent. Or, or a tent. <laughs> well, you can make the walls out of you know canvas type material, and that gets that. There are other questions about it, but in general, yes, that is possible. But the skakh has to be made from only natural materials, precisely because of this issue that it can't become ritually impure. The, the roof <laughs> yep. can use anything to tie, right? Ah, okay. So to attach it, or in some cases to support it, yes, you can use man-made yeah, objects yeah. for that. So. You know, if you want to use um, zip ties to hold it down or bungee cords or something like that, no problem. Just make sure that it's not made of zip ties. <laughs> Woven zip tie mat. On them. But, uh, but yeah, you can't just roll out like a plastic tarp for your roof. That, that doesn't work. Everybody agrees, man-made object. Okay. We are on 310. Okay. Right. Can you start? Yeah. Okay. In three cases, Rabban Gamliel was strict, like the words of Beth Shaman. Which, again, means that he loses. Um, however, it is interesting to still know his, note his personal practice. One, first part, one may not wrap up hot food on a festival for the Sabbath. Okay. I'm going to do these a little bit piece by piece in yeah. case we run out of time. Um, so, on, on, on a festival, on a Yom Tov, right? Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot. We are allowed to cook for the needs of that day, period. But what happens when the festival is right before Shabbat? When are you going to cook your Shabbat food? What's that? So one option is to cook it a few days before. And for those of us who have easy ways of reheating or refrigeration, refrigeration right. great idea. You lived 2,000 years ago. No, the food by the time Shabbat comes around, it, well, it won't be spoiled. Well, it'll be spoiled by our modern standards. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it would be edible by their standards, but it would not be the ideal Shabbat food, right? That they wanted to eat nice on Shabbat and festivals. However, what you would, what they said was, if you are cooking for the festival before the festival begins, you are allowed to continue cooking by the time Shabbat, before Shabbat begins, but still on the festival, right? So what you do is you make a special Erev. Now, Erev, you might know, is a word that's used as a way of creating a barrier so that you're allowed to carry from one domain to another, uh, the issue that Natan had brought up before about Shabbat. This is a different kind of Erev, because uh, that Erev means a mixture. This is a different kind of mixture, but here we are mixing not the spaces around us, but we are mixing the cooking. So if you make what's known as an eruv tafshilin, uh, a cooking eruv, before the festival begins, usually people just like boil an egg or something, and there's a special thing we say, then that creates a precedent that I am cooking for the festival and Shabbat, and then on the festival I can still cook for Shabbat, and it's okay and, and we're good. Make sense? I can finish the meal that I started cooking before. Exactly, exactly. But even but what you cook before Shabbat can be symbolic. Uh, it doesn't have to be like the main course or something. 
but it does have to happen uh, before. Now, so in, in our modern uh, diaspora world here where we have two day Chag, this comes up a lot because we'll often have a Thursday, Friday Chag, and then we'll have Shabbat, you know, Friday night, Saturday. And so that means the Eruv is happening on Wednesday. Make sense? Okay. Uh, most good Sidorim will have the procedure for how to take care of this uh, for, for cooking and preparation uh, for Shabbat. So, one may not. No, 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 no. That's only the general topic. Yeah. Now the specifics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one may not, not join together. No, no, one well, may not, not wrap up hot food on a festival for Shabbat. So, he oh. was of the opinion that not only are you not allowed to cook on Shabbat, to cook on a festival for Shabbat, you're not allowed to even wrap food and keep it warm for Shabbat. So he was even more stringent on that separation because wrapping it was akin to cooking. It was too much like cooking in his mind. So how would he have food for Shabbat right after the festival? He doesn't go into his own home recipes. <laughs> so we don't get an example of how he would make Or how we should. If, we, if I can't cook it or wrap it, mm. then comes Shabbos. Would well, I go hungry? But the, well, no, you wouldn't go hungry, but you wouldn't necessarily be eating freshly right, cooked food. Yeah. Right? Oh. People had all sorts of preserved food and cold food that they, well, cold, no, cold room temperature food that they would eat. Remember, no refrigerators. Um, one of the greatest inventions in all of human history, oh, refrigeration. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean that in all seriousness, oh. not, not just because it makes our life convenient. It has been one of the things that has helped with starvation and gotten rid of disease mm -hmm. more than almost any other medicine uh, advance that we've had. Uh, in fact, it made a lot of medicines available and possible, but that's a whole nother discussion. Back to the question here. So yes, they would have something else that wasn't fresh and hot and prepared. Well, that um, was a salad. You know, I'll give you a little confession. Uh, my kids love deli sandwiches, and since Brown Deli went out of business, getting kosher deli sandwiches is not an option for us easily. So occasionally we will have on our Siwadah Shlishi, our, our final meal of Shabbat, we'll do home deli sandwiches. You know, we'll get the kosher deli meat and we'll, we'll, we'll make it up and all of that. So even though it is traditional to have a hot meal as your final meal of Shabbat, because my kids love deli sandwiches so much and there's no other time for them to get them anywhere else, it really does make Shabbat special for them. And they, they cheer when we pull out the deli meat. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's one place where I step across tradition, but I think I'm still absolutely in the spirit of Shabbat. <laughs> okay. Part two. Part two. One may not join together a lamp on a festival. Okay. So our lamps are operated by a switch over there. Yes. <laughs> their lamps were often um, just clay objects, but some of their lamps had multiple pieces. And the question here is whether you're allowed to put those pieces together to assemble the pieces in order to use it on Shabbat. We're not talking about making it from scratch. We're not talking about um, like putting together the clay and smoothing it and finalizing it. This is a lamp that was meant to be in multiple pieces and all you're doing is stacking the pieces together, filling it with oil and transferring a fire to it, which is allowed on a festival, not allowed on Shabbat. And the answer is, well, Mangamliel says no, and the sages said yes, right? That that is perfectly fine for a festival, not on Shabbat again, but it isn't okay, but Raman Gamliel disagreed with them. It's maybe a little bit clearer to see, okay? One may not bake on festivals thick loaves of bread, but only wafer cakes. Okay, so again, this has to do with the idea that not only are we not allowed to cook on a festival for Shabbat, we're not supposed to cook on a festival with the intention of making leftovers, right? You're not supposed to say, well, since it's a festival, I get to cook, you know, for tonight, but I'm also going to cook enough so that we'll have leftovers for next week. Not allowed. So the argument here is if you make big, thick loaves, there's obviously going to be leftover, and you would be deliberately creating the leftovers. The sages disagree. The sages say, no, cook what you want to cook, and if there happen to be leftovers, because that's just part of the recipe, that's okay. Right? You, you can't sit there and say, all right, how, many, how much more do I want to cook so I can sell it next week? That you're not allowed to do, but just make what you want to make, and if there's leftovers, there's leftovers. That's why God invented Tupperware. Yeah, but there, you can also play and say, oh, you know what, I, I can uh, make a dinner, okay, mm -hmm. a very big one, like three times the amount of food that they usually eat. Right. Oh, oops, there's a leftover, so I can continue uh, uh, eating on Shabbat, so you are cooking for Shabbat. Right, well, that, that's, you know, partly a question uh, of whether you're cooking for, for Shabbat by accident on purpose. 
Um, but that would still have been cooked long before Shabbat itself is coming up, right? You wouldn't be cooking like in the afternoon for that. You'd be cooking in the, the previous part of the day. So it's, it's less of a worry that it would happen right up against Shabbat as, as an obvious thing. It would be, you know, well, I've got leftovers. Um, the question here is bread, you know, they didn't worry about their bread going stale so much. Yeah. They would make bread constantly. But the idea here was that if you're making certain types of bread, you're always, not just like pretend always, but you're always going to have more than you probably need for that meal. And that was what Rabban Gamliel and Beit Shammai were, were worried about. But the sages were not worried about it because there is, again, I think we even started with this, and maybe that was part of our discussion before we began the camera. Um, if you're strict on one thing, you're lenient on another, right? So there is, you know, the, there is the Simchat Chag, right? There is the joy of the festival. And if you're saying you can't have the bread you want because you might end up with leftovers, then you are taking away from the joy of the festival. And some people are very, very strict on being as happy as they can be on the festival. They want to really rejoice because they feel that is, well, a commandment because it is a commandment. And so just by being super strict on a festival would mean that you are being super lenient on, uh, being super strict on the cooking means you're going to be super lenient on the enjoying in some cases. So you can't you can't be strict about everything. And also you shouldn't be lenient about everything either. It's about finding what's needed for this situation. Is there any maximum amount of leftovers? Can I look at the limit? Okay, this is the limit. How much legally left a lot of Not that I've ever been told. Um, I, I think if you were to turn on your industrial mixer for making like, you know, 20 pounds of challah, uh, when it's only you and your wife, and you own a and you own a bakery, uh, <laughs> you're probably pushing it. But again, it comes back to our question of intent. Uh, you know, if it, ultimately only you know whether you really are deliberately doing this in order to eat it after the festival is over. Um, but the the sages did not want to put in a hard limit on that. Um, but I, I think most of us would know when we are deliberately throwing four extra chickens in the oven. Just because it's convenient, because we've got the oven nice and hot. I think most of us would know when we've done that. And, and you know what? If I know, God knows. <laughs> no, I the punishment is, is different according because we're breaking the Shabbat. Or the rules of the punishment is different. Breaking Shabbat? Breaking no, the festival. No. The, festival. the festival, right, right. Festival, yeah. Right. Uh, yes. <laughs> but some, so, that, so it's not so theoretical. So people can't. It, it's not theoretical, but it down. is. But it's not something the court would arrest you for. Right. If you if you go out on, on the festival and you light a big bonfire in the center of the town after people have warned you, the court can arrest you for that under traditional Jewish law. Right. If someone finds out that you made a few extra loaves, that's not something the court's going to arrest you for. Um, even if they suspect that maybe you kind of did it on purpose. Ultimately, that they'll leave in God's hands uh, for, for punishment, if at all. I thought they were encouraging this legal fiction, though. Which legal fiction? The fact that you start cooking for the festival. Oh, they are. Yes. And then you cook for Shabbat. Absolutely. Oh, uh, so well, let's go ahead and finish up the case study, and then we'll talk about the whole cooking before festival and all of that as a general rule, and that'll help us maybe a few insights, and yes. then we'll have to call it night. So Rabbi Gamliel said, in all their days, my father's house never baked large loaves, loaves but only wafer cakes. Right, so he brings proof that he was raised, this is the way you do it. And they said to him, what can we do with regards to your father's house? For they were strict in respect to themselves, but were lenient toward Israel to let them bake both large loaves and even charcoal roasted loaves. Right, which were another form of, uh, of loaves that were even more difficult to make. And the, the idea here is, is a brilliant one, which is, yes, I get it. You want to be strict on yourself for this point, but that doesn't mean you get to be strict for everyone else. Right? There is a difference when you're making halakha between saying, this is the way I'm going to practice it in my house and saying, this is the way everyone must practice it or else they are in violation of Jewish law or else they have broken the mitzvah, the commandment. And that is an incredibly important principle that comes up in a number of places in, in, in Jewish law where we say, yeah, strictness for yourself, your own chosen strictness to go beyond what the actual law is can be okay. Not automatically okay. That doesn't mean you run out and become strict on everything just because it's fun. Right? It has to be done 
with the proper, proper intention and the proper balance, not just as a, a form of what someone described to me as spiritual materialism. <laughs> People who consume additional spiritual signaling and showing off of, ooh, look at how strict I am with myself. That, that's not actually being spiritual. That's being like a consumer of Gucci bags, but you just happen to do them of mitzvahs, right? I, I have 15 mitzvah badges. It's like, no, <laughs> it's not the Boy Scouts. Um, nothing against the Boy Scouts. They do lots of good things. Um, so this idea of it is okay to be strict with yourself under those sort of circumstances, but that doesn't mean you get to make the law for everyone else strict too, because that, that's just not the law. Right? The law says it's okay. Uh, and we know that because the rabbis all voted and they agreed that the law says it's okay. Make sense? All right, so the legal fiction ish uh, uh, of the era of Tafshilin, of the cooking beforehand in order to be able to cook on the festival. So what the rabbis will often do is they will create a fence uh, around the, the Torah. That is to say, they'll create a, a limit for our behavior in order to ensure we don't accidentally step across the line of, of the commandment. And that means we'll often stop before we hit that point. But having made that fence, every now and then in their own fence, they will make a little bit of an exception. So when they make a, a fence that says, you're not allowed to cook on the festival that you might accidentally continue to eat afterwards, only you really know if it's true, that is their fence around the Torah, uh, around the Torah, which says cook just for the day of what you need. The Torah is not 100% super explicit that you're not allowed to have leftovers. So the rabbis made it explicit, you're not allowed to make leftovers. But having said that, they then put in this special cushion to say, but if you start cooking early, then it's not really leftovers because it's pre-planned. So they're making an exception to their own rule they're not making it an exception to the actual commandment, right? They're making an exception to their buffer. They're not making an exception to the actual mitzvah. So absolutely, they will encourage the exception that preserves both the buffer in general, as well as the mitzvah itself perfectly intact. And that happens in many places of, of how the rabbis will um, settle issues. That happens with the idea of eruv in general, right? The, the idea of whether we can transfer from domain to domain is a shaky one uh, of exactly where and how that is prohibited by the Torah itself. The rabbis therefore clear it up by saying, don't transfer from one domain to another. But having made that large fence around the Torah, almost literally in this case, they then make a fictional fence to allow us to travel within our communities and still be part of a community during uh, a festival or during a Shabbat time. So they make an exception to their own rule to preserve both the general um, buffer that they've made, as well as the mitzvah itself that is at the core of what they're aiming for. And with that, we'll call it a night. Mm -hmm.